Uh, this is our third meeting for this Lojong class. And um, just to do a little bit of re reflection on what we covered in the last two class. The first class, we dedicated almost the whole class to, to understand the background, the, the story of uh, Adisha Dibamkara and also Drum Temba and uh, Adisha's uh, travel from India to Tibet and his teaching of uh, uh, how the Lojong teaching came into being uh, and so on and so on. So that was for the first class. And uh, uh, for the second class, we read a little bit from the text. We read the first part, which is training in the preliminaries. And uh, we discussed the three points about uh, meditating on the preciousness of human life and impermanence, and also on uh, seeing the faulty nature of the samsara, suffering as uh, the part and parcel of this life. So we discussed that in detail. So today we will be moving to the next topic so in, in the line from the uh, from the seventh point, which is the actual generation of bodhicitta. So this is um, very important and the actual practice in the Lojong tradition. And as you can see from the way Lojong is designed, uh, even though it's very simple with very fewer lines and sentences with only seven point, but we can see that it it really contains all the core teachings of. Uh, Lord Buddha, especially the Mahayana teachings, are uh, the essence of all the Mahayana teachings are incorporated in a very simple format for us to easily follow without the need of relying on many texts or teachings. And uh, uh, having said that, it's also very important to have the background understanding of how the other practices and everything. And since most of you are very well versed with the Lambin teachings and also other Lochung teachings. So this will be uh, really helpful for all of us. And uh, uh, the, generally we say the Lord Buddha gave almost 84,000 different teachings in one context. Or we can say Lord Buddha gave teachings uh, depending on the three uh, classes of the students, those four Sharaka, Pratika Buddha, and Bodhisattvas. Those who uh, are in the hearer and the, what we call the solitary realizers and the Bodhisattvas. And uh, the way these uh, teachings are classified generally do not have anything to do from the students or those listeners keep a uh, nature or their well-being or anything, but it's all about what sort of teaching is relevant for a particular student at the time. So that's how, that's why we can see so many classifications and so many different teachings of Lord Buddha. And this particular one is entirely based on a uh, generation of bodhicitta, the awakening mind. And uh, therefore, it's uh, if we have to include uh, that teaching, it, it has to be the part of the great Mahayana teachings. And uh, as we study in the Lamrim, uh, that generation of the bodhicitta or cultivating bodhicitta is the gateway to enter the path of uh, bodhisattva. So the cultivation of bodhicitta becomes so important. And that is the root of all the happiness and the, the selfless care uh, for the benefit of all sentient beings. So therefore in the Lojong text, as soon as the preliminary teaching is completed, Joje, uh, Adisha, uh, Dibankara, or Drum Temba, just focus on cultivation of bodhicitta in the second. So this is the, the main practice that is training in the cultivation of bodhicitta. So before we go through, I also wanted to tell you a little bit about what do we mean by awakening mind? Because in English, we use different translations. So sometimes you may get confused. So therefore, I will be using the term bodhicitta in this class because I assume that we are all uh, familiar with this term. Um, the bodhicitta is made up of two, two words. The first one is bodhi and the second chitta. Bodhi has an understanding of being awakened from something, uh, getting up from a deep sleep, similar to uh, the word buddha. And the, the root of Bodhi or the Buddha are same, the Sanskrit word, which is Buddha, which just means to, to awaken from something. 
And uh, we can also apply this context to know something because when you understand a new context or a new uh, teaching, when you achieve a new realizations, until before that, your thoughts on that particular context has been kind of sleeping mode because you didn't realize that. So when you are understood that the Sanskrit term used is to be awakened on a new context. So that's why they use the, the word Buddha even for understanding, not just awakening. So awakening as taking the context of understanding. Chitta just means, um, uh, in general, chitta just means maybe we can, uh, for the time being, say a mind. Uh, but if we go a little bit deeper, um, in the Buddhist, uh, usually uh, in the Abhidhamma Buddhist or any kind of Buddhist philosophical text, they really give a lot of importance to the different and the varieties of the minds and the mental events that we possess. And among all these cluster of minds and mental events, which are around 55 of them in the study of mind and mental events, which I will not go through in detail. So bodhicitta belong to which particular mind or mental events? So this is denoted by the term chitta, which means it is uh, Apart from the mind and the mental events, it's mind, the category that belongs to the mind. So I think that's just uh, what we needed to understand at the moment, uh, understanding bodhicitta as that. And I also wanted to uh, let you know that the Tibetan word that the translators use for uh, bodhicitta is chanjukisem, chanjukisem. And it's a very, uh, <clears throat> people praise that it's such a wonderful translation, but uh, Jang Chup again has understanding of Jang as purifying or dispelling all the negativities that we have inherited in our past and this life, getting rid of all the delusions and afflicted emotions, cleansing one with all the negative things. Jang means to clear everything on one side. Chup means, and then what you gain out of it is once you delete it or cleanse all the afflicted emotions that we have in us, on the other hand, you gain the realizations on everything that is in the world. So you have, so on one hand, you you get rid of all the afflicted emotions, the three poisons that are present within you, and on the other hand, you gain your knowledge or wisdom to cover the whole world, the whole, everything that happens in this world. So that is called Jangchu. So it's a very beautiful translation that we do not have in the original word Bodhi but Tibetan added that realization to it and make it even more complete. So uh, just for understanding the, the term bodhicitta, I uh, thought that this could be uh, interesting. So in this class, we will be using the term bodhicitta uh, from now onwards when we refer to the cultivation of uh, the awakening mind. Um, and again, uh, in the text, you can find that the bodhicitta actually categorized into two different two two different categories, uh, which are quite different from it, uh, the, uh, each other. The first one is called what we call conventional bodhicitta, and the second one is called ultimate bodhicitta. So, what are these terms? What, what do we mean by uh, these two, and what is the relevance of that? I think that's also important to know. And uh, in this Lochung text also, even though it's such a very short text, it it uh, it pays so much importance to the cultivation of bodhicitta by giving these two separately, one first and the, the other later. So therefore, we also need to know uh, about these two things. The conventional bodhicitta is the, 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 the bodhicitta that really is the gateway to practice Mayana teachings. The bodhicitta that is driven by the great compassion in the beginning and a thought that uh, intends uh, the liberation of all sentient beings from the suffering and bring them to the state of enlightenment. So that is called the conventional bodhicitta. So here the, the understanding of conventional is something that is common to everyone, something that is common to all the the 10 grounds of Bodhisattva. 
from the beginning till the end. So therefore it's called conventional. So let's take the conventional as something like that for the moment. Ultimate here, what it really refers to is that the conventional bodhicitta can be understood as the skillful means that one need to have, uh, one need to accumulate the, the merits and also a lot of other practices in order for, for us to become enlightened. The ultimate thing is the cultivation of merits, the gener generosity, and those things are not uh, merely enough. We also need the wisdom, understanding, the emptiness. So they two has to be combined together in order to, to, to get our ship sailed, you know, to go further. So therefore, the ultimate bodhicitta just means the, the understanding the ultimate truth, which is the emptiness. So let's take that uh, for the time being. And what is the definition of bodhicitta? Let's try to do it, do this in a more a kind of a debate class. There's many of you are interested. What what is the definition of bodhicitta? What are the boundaries of bodhicitta? And what does bodhicitta really do? In the text, it says bodhicitta is sometimes called a mind with two aspirations mind that is driven by two aspirations. So the, the one aspiration that goes first and one aspiration that goes along with the bodhicitta. Now what are these two? You you did you ever get aware or thinking that in the Luchong text we only talk about bodhicitta, but we never talk about compassion. We never talk about karuna great compassion. But in the conventional Mayan understanding, great compassion is the root of all the practice. And in that context, why the great compassion is not even touched in the Lojong text? The only explanation is that compassion has been understood as the basic necessity because in order to generate bodhicitta, it has to be driven by a great compassion that goes before that. So you have to first meditate on compassion, understand compassion, develop compassion, and that compassion will bring the bodhicitta by itself. So this is the this is the understanding of the relation between these two. So the aspiration that goes before you actually generate bodhicitta is called the great compassion. So great compassion is the cause that uh, brings bodhicitta in you. So that's very easy to understand. We can discuss that. And then if the great compassion goes before bodhicitta, then why do we need to? Do you ever, maybe you can ask yourself questions. Why these practices are so complicated with so many different things, you know? Why we cannot be just simple like Zen practice and not to have <laughs> all these complicated terms and the practices, you know? Uh, why do we need bodhicitta? Um, it says that, it seems that the compassion is the, the kind of the ability or the sense of us that wishes someone to be free from suffering. In the last class, we talked about uh, street dogs in India and uh, India and Nepal and, and in, in some of the Asian countries. And... Uh, in, when you see a dog that really uh, is malnourished, didn't get any food, nobody takes care, so uh, maybe limping and so and so on, or maybe when you see a mother dog with a lot of puppies, you know, so instantly you get a kind of a very strong wish to 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 get rid of the suffering that she is at the moment, whatever suffering you can alleviate the dog from. So. That sense that you automatically comes in you is called compassion. And then the bodhicitta, what it really does is, having had that kind of attitude on the foundational level, bodhicitta says that I wanted to, not only I wanted to free them from suffering, I also wanted to bring them to the state of enlightenment. And I wanted to bring them to the Buddhahood. Because we feel that free, being free from samsara is also a kind of temporary uh, relief. It's not the ultimate goal. So the ultimate goal is 
to make everyone enlightened to become Buddha. But in that case, how can you do that? How you are only one in this numberless sentient beings, and you, how can you do that? The other sentient beings are millions and trillions. And here it says that first, I need to, now there are different ways of uh, uh, cultivating bodhicitta. The most common way is first, I need to become myself enlightened because it is only when I become enlightened, then I will have the power and the capacity to understand the other sentient beings need. What is the most relevant teaching? And then I can help. But this is not selfish. But this is a very wise step. Just imagine why Lord Buddha became enlightened first before he gave, he turned the Dhamma wheel three times, before he gave the 84,000 teachings. Why he couldn't do that before he became enlightened? The only difference is that before you become enlightened, Lord Buddha says, I can help people, I can give teaching, but the, the angle or the amount of the benefit I can do, there is a huge difference. When I know people's thinking, when I know people's mind stream, then I can give the proper kind of guidance to them. So therefore, he gave so many different teachings depending upon the people's uh, thinking and, and the way of their life. So therefore, what I'm trying to say here is that bodhicitta is the, the concern that is within us to bring all sentient beings to the state of Lord Buddha and a kind of very strong commitment from yourself that I am going to do it. I'm not waiting for the others to, to do something. I'm going to do it. So this is pure bodhicitta. And uh, just imagine, I mean, nowadays, when we see very sad crisis all, all over the world, uh, just as you said now about the crisis in Palestine and Israel, and also in Ukraine and Russia, what we really do on an individual level or on a national level, what many people do is we remain indifferent. Because sometimes we feel that, oh, I have nothing to do with that. Maybe we feel it's not affecting me directly. So we remain indifferent. Or maybe you think, maybe even though if you have some concern, but still you may feel, oh, what can I do? I'm just one sentient being. I'm just one. And, and the, the crisis is so huge. What difference can I make? So you just didn't even attempt to make the difference, to do, to do something from yourself. So that is why bodhicitta is that special kind of empowerment uh, that gives you the power that every individual have that capacity. If you go and do something, you have the capacity to make every sentient beings enlightened. You, and just you, merely you, you do not have to rely on other people, but you can do it yourself. So that's why now you will see the difference between great compassion and the bodhicitta. So great compassion drives you to do something and bodhicitta actually makes you do that. So these are two different things. <clears throat> that's, one, uh, that's one thing. And now before we go through the actual thing, I also wanted to touch base on one important thing about when we talk about uh, benefit for whole sentient beings, when we talk about liberating every sentient being suffering, there's always a concern about self. There's always concern about individual. What happens to me? Because we think that bodhicitta or the great compassions are all kind of focused towards outwards to other people in this world. But at the end of the day, it is you yourself. Lord Buddha also says you are your own protector. There is not a God or the Savior that will help you. So you have to protect yourself. You have to be your own teacher. That is also the teaching of Buddha. And Lord Buddha also said we have to help other sentient beings. 
So is there a contradiction between these two? I think many people think there is a contradiction between these two. So therefore, many people uh, misunderstand the practice of great compassion and bodhicitta as neglecting yourself, not doing anything for yourself, and completely forgetting your own concern and well-being. So therefore, in the uh, in the modern concept, we talked about self-compassion, why self-compassion is so important, why you have to begin from yourself, why you are also the part of uh, all these things and that you are not ne neglected. Because when you care so much about other people and practice compassion and bodhicitta, and at the end of the day, if you really depress you, if that depresses you, if that makes you feel more sad and agitated, then that's not what we are really looking forward to, to it. So Shantideva says that bodhicitta is not like that. Even though you see the suffering of all the sentient beings, still, of course, there is sadness. There is sadness. There is a, a kind of a, when you see uh, things happening that are out of your control. That's why we say bodhisattvas always cry. Uh, we the, we also have a uh, bodhisattva name, the always weeping bodhisattva, you know, the student of that one. Uh, such a beautiful story is there. But that doesn't make them lose hope and lose aspiration to do thing for others. That even empowers them to do more So at the, day by day. So that's the difference. <clears throat> And uh, it's all about how do you get depressed by uh, practicing compassion to all the mother sentient beings. That's also something we need to think about. Sometimes we practice compassion with a very self-centered attitude, thinking that at the end of the day, it will make me happy. So there, the, the, the prior intention was also not correct. So, I mean, we will not go into detail. So, this text, um, so till here is a kind of introduction, and then this text actually uh, dedicate the second part to the generation of bodhicitta. And uh, in the generation of bodhicitta, as I mentioned before, the two, the conventional and ultimate. Zarina, can you put up the text? And... In some texts, we can find that. In some, uh, no, never mind those dots. Uh, those are just a Tibetan script. Maybe you don't need. Uh, so in some texts, uh, you can find that in the Lojong that the ultimate bodhicitta is meditated first, and then the conventional bodhicitta meditated afterwards. But according to the tradition of Tsongkhapa and. Uh, uh, many other uh, great masters they they advise or they prefer that the conventional bodhicitta should be meditated on first followed by the ultimate bodhicitta so that makes sense so we will also follow according to according to these two <clears throat> so the first one is meditating on the conventional bodhicitta so the line <clears throat> uh, there is uh, the line reads like this, train in the two, giving and taking alternately. These two are to be mounted on the breath. Three objects, three poisons, and three roots of virtues. In all activities, train by applying words. Begin the process of taking with yourself. So this line talks about what we call the generation of bodhicitta through Tonglen, Tonglen practice. The, the so famous tone and practice in English, what we call exchanging self with others, exchanging the the benefits of the self uh, with the sufferings of the other people. There's a tone and practice, and uh, in the text generally, we talked about two ways of gener generation of bodhicitta. Atisha himself. Uh, the Lamp for the Path to Enlightenment and other texts talks about generation of bodhicitta through 
seven point cost and result, which you can find in Lumrim. Uh, first, sentient, uh, meditating on all sentient beings as your mother. And then uh, recollecting their kindness. And then meditating on repaying their kindness, so and so forth. So this is one way to uh, meditate on bodhicitta. How you can, we at this moment, just imagine, how can you even generate such a thing? When we are uh, in a modern competitive society with so many things going on, how you even begin to meditate? So Adisha says, okay, no problem. First, what you do is try to meditate on all sentient beings as your mother, which is not easy. And therefore, what you have to do, even before that, what you have to do is first, you have to uh, meditate on economity. So the economity means, of course, in our day-to-day -day life, we have someone whom we call near or dear ones. And we also have a section of other people who we refer to as uh, distant ones or you know, not so near ones. Maybe not, you know them, but they are quite distant. And then there is a third category, what we call neuter. So just as I said before, sometimes we think that what happens in one part of the world doesn't really have any effect to us because we think they are neutral to us. They are neither my friend nor my enemy. They're just neuter. So Adisha says, first you have to meditate, try to reduce this gap and then meditate on economy. That is, try to reduce the gap and meditate all beings as equal. And for for on a for on a real practice level, if we do not, if we have difficulties with meditating the whole sentient beings, we can begin with a few people. We can initially the practices, we can begin with just three. Identify three persons whom you know well. That is one way to do it. Maybe one whom you are very close to, and whom you are, uh, whom you can, whom you really hate, and a neutral one. Just identify three of them, and then try to reduce the gap between these two until you have kind of a very uh, equal perspective of these three people. That is one way to do it. Or the text also says, even if you have difficulties when people say identify, just meditate with using symbols like Mr. A, B, C, or X, Y, Z. So say A is your friend, B is your folk, and C is your neutral. Just imagining a conceptual people out there and then do your meditate. So these are very beautiful techniques that one can follow. And then when things are a little bit more equal and subtle, and then gradually it's more easier to, to meditate or recognize them as your, your mother or someone you're close to, and then compassion will come up. So otherwise it will not jump up and uh, come up so easily. So this is one step, the gradual step we call it. Now the more effective step is exchanging your own happiness with the suffering of others. The practice called Tonglen. So just as we see, we always say that if you are not able to experience what, are, what the people are suffering, try to be in their shoes or try to be in their place and think about it. That is what we see in usual. For example, if we have to meditate on the people suffering in the other part of the world where war is going on, and then try to be one of those who are really suffering. And then imagine. So people who doesn't really know whether the tomorrow sunrise is going to be earlier or your next life. So in this way, when you really compare and meditate in this way, you will gain a kind of strong urgency for you to do something. I cannot delay it. I cannot do it tomorrow. I cannot say I can do it the next month. You have to do it immediately. So there is a kind of urgency uh, which is involved with that. So therefore, uh, exchanging self and other is kind of really the practice that we derive from Shantideva. So the, the first line says, uh, 
the Tibetan Tonin Nyebo Pemarchang, which means training in the two, giving and taking alternately. So alternately here it says giving and taking, what you give and what you take. This is a kind of a conceptual practice. What you give is, if you have physical objects that you can give to someone who is really, for example, if you see a dog who is really, who re, uh, that really needs water, you can just give the water bottle that you have to that dog. So what you give is a possession that you have and you give that to the dog, right? What you take from the dead dog is the, the suffering that the dog was enduring out of thirst. You took it upon yourself. So therefore, when you do in that way, even though you are just giving a bottle of water or maybe just a cup of water to that dog, but that action becomes really different because you're taking or imagining the suffering that that dog really goes without getting water for hours and days and days. You are putting your own self into that dog's state and trying to understand that suffering. And then when you give that water, so the, the feeling is different. That is called giving and taking. Now on the next level, how do we give practice Tonglen with us? Uh, with someone whom you don't know or whom you have never seen. Is that in the text, we say that, of course, the possessions, the material possessions that you have are great, but these are not the best possessions that you have. What you really have the best possessions are your merits, <clears throat> the accumulations that you have done out of doing good practices, meditating on emptiness and so on and so on. These are the virtues and accumulations that will have you gain a better rebirth, make you happy in this life, and also for the next life. These are kind of your real treasure. And now the practice is you must give this. You must forsake these qualities that are within you to the people who are in need of them. So give your well-being, give your accumulations, give your merit to the other people, and then take their suffering upon you. So this is not 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 an easy uh, not an easy uh, practice. But the tonglen, the, the way to do tonglen is giving and taking alternately is one at a time. You first give your well being, your virtues, and take the suffering upon you. And these two are to be mounted on the breath. Is here in the second line. It, teaches us about how do we actually practice it that in the beginning about uh, practicing of tone and using our breath. So when you breathe in and when you breathe out. So for, it begins with you breathing out and then second you breathe in. So when you breathe out, imagine all the well-beings and the virtues and the possessions that you have are mounted on that breath. I mean, take the take the take your breathing as a horse or a right which carries all the, your breaths and then writes they leave from your body to the other beings spread that's what it means and then when you breathe in again that same right brings in all the people's suffering sickness difficulties problems in their life to you so that that is how you have to uh, train in yourself. I mean, we do not have time to do an, an actual uh, practice, but though these practice as any kind of meditation, you can do it for seven times, 21 times, 10 times, uh, whatever uh, in the beginning. And then we can, these are the m kind of means to begin and then later make it more, uh, make it more uh, kind of intense in your practice. The third line actually identifies, just as I said, three objects, three poisons and the three roots of virtues. Three objects are, you have one object which is attractive and you have another object that is non-attractive and you have a third object that is neuter. So what, what we really do is when we look at the attractive object, we get desire. We, I want them. I wanted to own them object. 
the desire comes out of looking at attractive objects. And anger and hatred and jealousy comes out of looking at unattractive or something that you dislike. And the third one is ignorance or the indifference here, kind of living, staying indifference comes from looking at the neutral objects or neutral people in this context. So this, when once you identify these three poisons and these three objects, what we are trying to do is exchange them among itself. What the kind of uh, attitude that you have towards your uh, neutral or the non-attractive object, try to bring that to the attractive ones. And uh, what you have the same desire for attractive, try to uh, convert or change that to the non-attractive one. So that's what the line here actually tells us. And the fourth line says, in all activities trained by Evelyn, Applying words. What it really means is sometimes if you face difficult, if you have hard time thinking about it, you used to say it from your mouth loud. So that's why we have these beautiful chantings in Lama Chaba. Oh great master, may all the uh, the sufferings of the sentient beings become upon me, and so on and so forth. So as you chant these beautiful lines and then meditate, what happens is when you recite, when you say these words loudly, it helps you even remember better, and then it will help with your meditation. And begin the process of taking that with yourself first. <clears throat> so this is about the generation of the, the conventional bodhicitta, which I said as before, first driven by great compassion, and then uh, also we practice with the seven point cause and effect, try a practice of meditating on all, all sentient beings as one's mother, and then meditating on their kindness and how to repay them and so on and so forth. And on in the next level, we meditate Tonglen. So uh, this is the kind of the brief, uh, uh, brief explanation for Tonglen practice. But Tonglen practice by itself is such an important and very deep practice and very effective one. So, Respecting the uh, time, I think we will go into the next uh, practice, which is generation of ultimate bodhicitta. Can you put up the slide once again, please? So the second is, as I, as I said before, ultimate bodhicitta just means meditating on emptiness. And in this Lojong context, uh, when we talk about meditating on emptiness, uh, we it really focuses on considering the, the awareness that is present within you. Just awareness. I'm not earlier I told you about there are around 55 mental events and collection of seven different minds and blah 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 blah, all those things. So when you look at them. It, it looks like so diverse, like the st stars that fill the clear night. When you look in the sky at night and you see the thousands and thousands of stars. So it looks sometimes very difficult to focus on uh, which one you need to really think about. So in this text, this, no, that is the wrong way to meditate on emptiness. We will only think about one, which is the mere, the ultimate or the mere awareness that is within you. Try to meditate on. Try to meditate on that. So the line begins with saying, "Consider all things and events as dreamlike." So the dreamlike here is what happens in the dream. Is in the dream. Sometimes you may dream as being a king or queen, or sometimes you may dream yourself as. Good things, bad things, different things. But when you wake up, you are the same person. So dream doesn't really change anything. So here, what it really means is that when you go out into the world, you see things, you meet people, you talk with them. Or uh, what things that they say makes a difference to you. Maybe you get angry or maybe you get uh, happy all of those things. What he really says that consider 
all of these things as a dream. They are not real, kind of fake. So there is nothing that is absolute in this world. Everything is like a dream. So it teaches us about emptiness. There is nothing that you can hold on to. And then it says, once you are able to meditate everything as a mere dream life, what you have to do is examine the nature of unborn awareness. So the term unborn, what it really meant here is, think about the, the eternal, I cannot say eternal, but the very innate awareness that you have. Think about this life, for example, when you are first born into this world, till now, there is a continual presence of awareness in us. Sometimes it is strong, sometimes it is low. Even when you are sleeping, even when you are in hospital, even when you are so happily dancing, singing, or partying, eating, but there is the presence of awareness that continues with the same intensity in us. But we, we are never aware of that. So here, what it means, unborn, is it's something like free of any kind of conceptualizations. For example, think that from when, when does this awareness that is within you begin? You cannot identify if you are a Buddhist and if you believe in previous life. So this, even though your physical body doesn't exist in the previous life, this awareness traveled from previous life. It was also present during your bardo. So there is not a certain point that you can say, oh, it began at that point. So therefore, there is no beginning to it. Therefore, you cannot identify a point when it first arises in you. So therefore, we call it unborn, which means we are not able to identify when it really arise in us. And then also it's unceasing, which means when will it end? Even though you will die, but it will continue to the next life. Even when you become enlightened, it will also continue in the enlightened form. So there is no cease, there is no end to it. Therefore, and also you cannot point a Space in your life where the awareness just stays still. No, it's always changing, moving, moving, moving from one moment to another. As we said, usually, if we talk about today's awareness within you, what is today? It's also a very conceptualization. Today is made out of 24 hours. 24 hours is made up of one hour. One hour made out of 60 minutes, 60, 60 seconds. Like this, if you break there's not an infinite moment that you can find. So this awareness is also uh, keeps on changing every minute and every second in our life. So therefore, try to meditate on the awareness as free of any of these things, a free of a uh, cluster of its own other emotions. Just meditate on one single awareness without any uh, qualities without any color, without any issue, just the mere existence of emptiness, just mere existence of uh, awareness. This is what we call the meditating on the emptiness of awareness. That awareness is without free of any forms and uh, characters. <clears throat> And then when that happens, let even the antidote be freed in its own place. What it means that if we need an antidote to, to treat all these uh, aversions and the thinkings that happens in our life, at this moment, let the antidote also be pressed aside. That's what it means. Do not even think about antidotes at this moment. And rest in the uh, Alaya Vijana. So <clears throat> this is a different context. The essence, which, which it means is that the awareness is traveling from the beginning less and then going ultimately, something like that. And between sessions, we are conjurer of illusions means, between sessions means if you are having a four or three sessions of such meditative 
on emptiness, just meditating on awareness. And when you get up from your session and then you go to bathroom or you go and have a cup of coffee, and then when you see things, you know, and then what is your, what is your reaction? And they say, oh, in between session, when you see physical things and something that may be something different from your time of your meditation, just consider them as illusions. That even though it, they appear, ultimately, there is no absolutism in them. So it's just an illusion. So this is this line uh, tells us about meditating on emptiness as, as a, a primary awareness. So these two uh, practices uh, generally covers the, uh, the meditation on cultivating of bodhicitta and bodhicitta, the conventional bodhicitta, and also the ultimate bodhicitta. And uh, and this is uh, as it says, this is the main practice in the lojong. What that really means is that the main practice is a practice that you need to do every day, or the practice that you need to do every time. So lojong practice, in short, mind training practice, in short, just means the practice of bodhicitta. So how do you train your mind? Means we are not training our mind to become very intelligent and do things for you, but train your mind so that it can serve and help other people. So the training, Jongwa, here, uh, I told you uh, during the first class that Jong or train also have an understanding of purification. So purifying our mind of all the negativities and then equipping it with the, all the characters to make it uh, kind of all equipped to become enlightened for the welfare of all such beings. I think that's for today. And in the maybe in the next one or two class, we will be able to go through the rest of rest of the materials because this is the actual practice and bodhicitta and the next two or three of them are not that uh, difficult. It's all a kind of how, once you have already generated the bodhicitta, now how do we protect the bodhicitta that is arisen in you from uh, decaying or losing? Sometimes we make so much effort to generate bodhicitta and then it's very sad if it, if it dies down in us. And so how to protect that? That will be covered in the, the other things. Okay. Thank you so much. So we have some time for questions, if any, or comments, or if any of you have practiced Tonglen in the past, how does it really feel? May I ask a uh, Actually, so many um doubt, not not really doubts but questions uh it's so interesting about the tonglen practice um so for example when i uh, did the recitations uh, it's very interesting that it says here that words actually help you i think they they'll help you in uh, in a way to uh, be remember the practice of Tonglen and also to do the visualizations. But uh, with the actual practice, I, I thought, for example, giving away possessions and merits and is uh, in a way it's easier. But then taking up someone's suffering is a bit difficult um, because somehow you think that this is not a real thing. That's a challenge. Yeah, uh, that's that's really true. I mean, I cannot speak from my own experience, but uh, what I heard from the, those practitioners about this uh, dominant practice, I think they say that uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, we can find it a bit challenging about how you're going to even make it a realistic practice. 
one metaphor that we can use here is that one metaphor that is often used in the Kadam teachings is just imagine a mother, it can be also father, but in the text it's the mother who has uh, who was really uh, in need of a son. I mean, she was not able to give birth to any children for many, 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 many years. And uh, for some mothers, so giving birth to a child is, is a great kind of achievement and a sense of fulfillment. And after many, many years, after going through trying all the options, maybe even praying and doing all those things, she gave birth to a child. And then for her, this is her world. There is no other, anything else more important, more precious than her child. There's nothing in this world. Even the Lord Buddha is not so important in that context. So one day, the child get a very severe sickness and illness. And if she cannot find a good treatment, uh, her child would die from that illness. And uh, even while uh, at the time of this illness, there's strong, there's a very presence of very strong uh, pain uh, in the uh, pain uh, that goes with the sickness in her child, in her, in his, in his or her body. So now let's look at Donan from this practice, this perspective. This mother is trying everything from herself to, to cure her son of this, to, uh, to make her uh, son or daughter free of uh, that pain. And if there is an option, possibility that she can take the, all the suffering that her child goes into upon herself so that her child becomes free, she's ready to do that. So this is what we, what we call Tonglen. So this is about the, the power of Tonglen that you, for us, it's in the, especially in the beginning, it's difficult because we do not uh, see the urgency to do it first. Second thing is we have such a distant, different approach to self and the other. There's such a big gap between that. So therefore, maybe you can give things to them, but you don't want to take up their suffering upon oneself. So, so this is the clear difference that we can see. But that mother was ready to do everything for her child, even taking all the pain and the suffering upon herself for his good health. So this is uh, what Tonglen is. Now, um, uh, Tonglen practice is sometimes very really unrealistic practice, that is for sure. And people may ask questions, why do you need to practice Tonglen? Because why do you want to suffer? And why do we need to even suffer, you know? have enough suffering for oneself, why we need to take all the other people's suffering. It's not really suffering. What uh, the suffering, what we define by, what we mean by suffering. That mother, when she takes the pain of her child upon herself, she's not suffering. She's actually feeling very rejoiced, feeling happy and relieved. Even though she may be having a lot of pain in her physical pain of bills, taking all the sufferings of her child upon herself. But eventually she's happier than before. She's so relieved, proud, and contented that she's able to do it. So there is no suffering in taking other people's pain upon oneself. So that's how you define suffering. Uh, so in Tonglen practice, taking other people's suffering or uh, the pain doesn't make you really suffer more. It actually makes you feel more encouraged and stronger. It's something like, um, it's something like this. Uh, maybe some of you might have went to the 
and Mount Everest, I don't know, or any part of Himalayas, uh, Himalaya, those uh, trackings, you know, uh, where people go for pilgrimage in Lavado or those things, you know, and there is no uh, road uh, for cars, so you have to carry everything on your back. So some people are so generous that they are ready to carry your back. I can carry it for you. I'm okay. I'm born in the mountain. I can carry it for you. So when you give your back to that person, that person really happily carries because he's so happy that you can now walk and uh, complete your pilgrimage. So that is a joy for that person. Even though when you give your back, your baggage to that person, his load becomes heavier. And there is a physical kind of suffering, physical pain that is related to the extra weight that he has to carry, right? But that doesn't make him suffer or make her suffer. He's even more rejoiced. Maybe if his body can, he will take one more. Maybe even carry you. <laughs> so so this is about Thonland. So we are all mistaken when we think that when we take other people's burden on ourselves, it doesn't become a burden to you. It becomes a cause for you to rejoice in that other person's uh, health. You know. Any other questions or comments? Uh, yes, I have a question about this ultimate mm -hmm. uh, bodhicitta. You mm -hmm. see, uh, you should consider all things and then just dream like. Mm -hmm. uh, this is when this is when you're not meditating, I guess, or or is it also uh, because uh, in the meditation you see things as clear, I guess, as as the as the reality. But uh, is this a is it one when you you're like a in your daily life you see everything as a dreamlike and then in the meditation you try to see it as it really is and then uh, should isn't it the goal to 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 see uh, things uh, as it is <laughs> so to say or is this just a practice yeah. to 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 come there like that exactly exactly you're you're absolutely right. Uh, when you say meditation, um, uh, if you are meditating on emptiness and uh, at the meditative state, uh, of course, you are meditating on the things, uh, reality, things as it is, free of all the elaborations and so and so on. And thinking of all the things as dreamlike in that Meditation, meditation context is definitely something to practice prior to your meditation or during what we call uh, off during in in between the sessions. So, if you are meditating on emptiness, that's definitely true. Uh, so, looking at the things, everything as a dream, like it's a means for you to uh, realize that they are empty. So that's why we have to flip the line also between sessions, meditate, uh, consider everything as illusions. So illusions and the dream like are almost same. You can take that as the same context. Because during meditate, uh, when you try to deconstruct everything and just meditate on empty of things as itself, not thinking about all the added qualities, Sometimes you really lose uh, absolutism. You cannot hold on to anything. That's why uh, we say that uh, for those who understood emptiness for the first time, there is a very, very uh, risk of getting a very strong fear that you lose your identity, you lose yourself. So people may fall down or so they try to touch wall or table or something. And for the monks, uh, we have something to hold here usually. And they say that you just hold your this thing, thinking that it, even though this is empty, but I can still hold on to it. It makes, it does its job. So this is like a dream. Even though it is like a dream, it serves its purpose. So, uh, so yeah, that, that, is the, that is the purpose for um, looking at everything as a dream like. 
But on another level of meditation, especially for beginners, we can also have real meditative sessions, meditating everything as dreamlike. That is also possible, but that is another context. Thank you. That's wonderful. I, I have another question. I, I, I sure. don't um, I think I missed the, there's this says that let even the antidotes be freed in its own place. Where is the own where <laughs> when is the its own place? And when <laughs> Yeah. So freed in its own place is a very actually this is a a uh, very beautiful practice that we uh, teaching that is uh, that comes in Satya tradition. So Lojong, as you can see, was initially written around 10th to 11th century, and it flourished so much in Tibet during 12th and 13th century when it was the time of flourishing of all the schools of Satya traditions. So in Satya traditions, the the beautiful meditation on just meditating about awareness, Seltong, they call it the clarity and empty nature of awareness. Just meditating the awareness as a very pure kind of a light and also empty that you cannot hold on to. So something like a, just a laser beam or some light, when you try to get hold of it, you cannot, maybe like rainbow in the sky. So cell means that is uh, illuminated, but still empty. That jinne means you cannot hold on to it, but and these are the nature of awareness that we have. Okay, now what it really says is that the antidote antidote means uh, when you meditate on such awareness, right? When you meditate on such awareness, usually we say that in meditations when you have distractions or those things, you need to use the antidote to counter those distractions and these things. So awareness and also the antidote for all the afflictions, they have to go hand in hand usually. So since the text says you only need to focus on awareness, then the, it asks about what do we do about the antidote? Is antidote not important in meditation practice to get rid of, to uh, for the other things? For example, when anger comes, do we not necessarily meditate on intolerance? Is just meditating on awareness enough? So these are the questions that comes. And then the answer is no. Antidote should be freed in its own place means antidote should be also deconstructed in the same way as awareness. It is also not entirely different from awareness. So the nature of the awareness itself also can, contains the power for it to become antidote. So do not imagine antidote there's something different from awareness. That is that is what it means. Freed in its own place means you do not need to have a different session or a different thinking about antidote. Just meditating on awareness itself will also free the antidote, which it means that the antidote will also function its own capacity when you're meditating on awareness. Right? For example, if I ask you, when you meditate on awareness, are you still practicing bodhicitta? Are you not practicing bodhicitta? Are you not practicing compassion? Are you abiding by the ethical discipline? And so and so on, all the other things, what happens to them? And they say that you don't need to worry about all those things. When you really meditate on awareness, everything else falls into place by themselves. That, that's uh, what it really means. But this is also not so easy to understand. Even I'm not 100% sure about this meditation. Okay, great. Thank you Thank for you. this.